so this time I was going to give some applications. But uh, so uh, let me just recall very briefly what I did the first time then. So here we have the big picture, uh, which is like this, that we have some blob up here, which is called beautiful X. So that's a complex manifold. It could be a domain in CN, it could be an open manifold, or it could be a compact or a, or a manifold. And then we have a projection map, P, that goes from this beautiful X down to a base manifold B, which is also a complex manifold. Uh, and uh, for instance, this here could be a, an open set in CN, and then this could be a linear projection. So, so there are many, uh, many possibilities. There are two, so to speak, two main cases. One is when it's an open set in CN, or CN, CN plus one in that case, because uh, think of this as one dimensional, then the relative dimension, the dimension in this direction would be N. And uh, <coughs> so there are two main cases. You think of this either as an open set in CN plus one, pseudo convex, and this is a linear projection down to C, or you think of it as a complex manifold, and then the typical case, uh, all the fibers here, we want them to be compact complex manifold. And then we can think of this here as T varies, we can think of those fibers as a family of complex manifolds. So, so I proved some theorems, I'm not going to go through them again, but I put the slides here in case I will want to go back to them. So this was the first theorem that was about the proper fibration. So that meant that all the fibers were compact manifold. We have a family of compact manifolds. And then all the time, when we have such a fiber, we think of the L2 space or the Bergman space or some holomorphic objects here. In the CN case, there would be holomorphic functions. Otherwise, there would be N forms with values in a line bundle L. That's what is intended by this notation here, ET. So this is the space for each T. We have a Hilbert space. Uh, in this case, finite dimensional, and that's the space of holomorphic function, uh, yeah, holomorphic sections of this bundle, which means that it's an N form with values in L. This means N forms. And then we can compute the L2 norms. They look like that. We get a metric. We get a family of vector spaces that has a metric. So it's a Hermitian vector bundle. And the conclusion was that the curvature of this vector bundle with this metric is positive or non-negative. Yeah. Yes, in this case, they will. So that's a non-trivial fact. Yeah. So in this case, it will be. We look at slightly more general cases at the end when this is not assumed. Or uh, we have uh, in the CN plus, uh, when, uh, when this is an open subset of CN plus 1, the or CN plus a a M in this case, uh, the formulation was a little bit more complicated. Maybe I do not go. Let's just remember that there was some rather complicated statement like this. And the special case of that was that if we have such a pseudo-convex domain, and we look for each slice here, we look at the Bergman kernel function here, uh, then the conclusion was that the logarithm of the Bergman kernel is uh, plurisubharmonic as a function of both the variables t and c. In particular, it's plurisubharmonic with respect to t there. So it, uh, in case t is one-dimensional, it depends subharmonically on the variable t, on the parameter. The plurisubharmonicity with respect to c is a very classical fact, which is always true. OK, so now we can start with the uh, applications. And maybe I can come back to those things later if we need that. So I'm going to talk first about the osawa takigoshi extension theorem. Then I have to draw a very similar picture here. Uh, we should not be confused with that one, although it looks almost the same. So, so we have a, a domain here, which is now called D in CN. And we have a, let me write it down here, and we have a hyperplane. No, it's not a hyperplane. It's a linear subspace that uh, supposedly intersects this. So here is V. I've chosen coordinates so that uh, the linear subspace is just a space where the last, no, the first coordinates are equal to zero. And we have a plurisubharmonic function in the big domain here. And uh, we assume that this domain is not very big. So this is the C prime direction here. And this is the C double prime direction. So this should not be confused with the other picture, because there is no pre, uh, yeah, uh, it will, yeah. 
uh, so I assume that this is not too big here. So I assume that C prime, some normalization is less than or equal to one here all the time. Okay. And then the theorem is the following. That's the Osawa Takigoshi theorem. It says that if we have a holomorphic function on this slice here, we can extend it holomorphically to the whole domain. So this is a classical fact. And, but we can do it in such a way that a certain L2 estimate holds. Namely, we extend it to capital H, and cap the L2 norm, weighted L2 norm of capital H, is bounded by a constant times the weighted L2 norm of uh, small h, which is the function that we extend on, on V. And the important thing is that C is a universal constant that does not depend on phi. Uh, after this, that's where the normalization comes in here. That's what makes the constant universal. So this is a non-trivial fact. It's the, it was proved by Osawa and Takigoshi. Uh, I should remember when, but I don't. Uh, and there are many versions of the theorem for manifolds, etc., for sections of line bundles, uh, etc., etc. And they actually very, it's actually a very useful fact. But I'm going to stick to the simplest case in order to show what it has to do with the theorems that I discussed last time. So one question that arose was the following. What is the best constant? We know that the C there is universal. So there was a question of what is the value of C. In a particular case, there was a conjectured answer to this. That, and the conjecture was called the Suitas conjecture. If you, yeah, it's probably not so well known. But, uh, uh, and the answer is the following. It was given by Spinia Bloschke and Guan and Shu. Uh, they found that the optimal value of C is sigma k, which is just the volume of the unit ball in, in uh, CK. So that uh, value is uh, obtained, is attained. If you take just this generic case when V here is just a point, say the origin of the unit ball in CK, and then you take a function there, one, say, and you want to extend it with as small L2 norm as possible. You take phi equal to zero then certainly the best extension will be the function that's constant equal to 1, and that will give you precisely this bound. So uh, it says that you have a better, uh, this is the worst es estimate. So uh, if you formulate it demagogically, you can say that this is the hardest extension problem, this uh, thing. You, you always get some, you never get a worse estimate than that in general. That's the theorem of Bloschke and Guan and Shu. Uh, it, uh, and uh, yeah. So I'm going to describe uh, an approach to prove this, uh, reprove their statement here, and prove maybe something a little bit sharper than that. And this is joint work with Laszlo Lempert. You heard of him maybe, Thomas? Yeah. Uh, and uh, huh? not recently. It was Thomas' advisor. But, uh, so the idea is this, that we look at uh, dt, which is the subdomain of C, such that the logarithm of mod c prime squared is less than t. So we shrink the domains here. I say that the logarithm of this should be less than t. So when t is now a negative number, it looks like this. I get this is dt here. No. dt, like that, this domain here. I look at this family of domains for t less than 0. So we exhaust D by subdomains. And they shrink, when T goes to minus infinity, they shrink just down to this plane here. And uh, you can view this as a special case of what we were looking at before, because you can now construct a domain in, uh, in uh, uh, one dimension higher, which is the domain I have down there. Beautiful D is a set of tau comma C, such as the logarithm of C squared. Uh, minus real part of tau is less than zero. So that's uh, th this corresponds to this picture now. So, and uh, this is a pseudo-convex domain because the function you have there is pluri-subharmonic. It's defined by a pluri-subharmonic inequality, so it's pseudo-convex. And uh, the dt's are the slices of this domain now. Right? The way I do it. Uh, yeah. So this is how we do it. So we have. Uh, and uh, then the theorem with uh, Laszlo is the following, that for each of those domains now, we can apply 
the Osawa Takigoshi, where well, we can think of the Osawa Takigoshi theorem, and says that there is an extension here, and, and we look at the optimal extension. There is always an optimal extension, the one, the one with the smallest norm. We call that HT, and uh, we look at its L2 norm. So that's the index T, that's the L2 norm over DT. I take, the, so to speak, the best extension for, over for DT. I take its norm, I multiply by this constant, e to the minus kt. So uh, obviously, the, those numbers, the norms here will be smaller and smaller. So I compensate for that by multiplying by e to the minus kt. And uh, then I prove that this is a, we prove that this is a decreasing function for t less than zero. That's the theorem with Lasto. This is a decreasing function. So what does that mean? It means, huh? huh? Yeah, it's still, yeah, it still gets more and more negative. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I really mean that it's decreasing. So, so, yeah, when as t increases, uh, yeah, it decreases. Yes, yes. So, uh, what I want about all is this inequality to hold. So, I, this is the quantity that I really want to estimate. It's the best. When when t is equal to zero, I have my original domain. And uh, if I got the decreasing, increasing right, that would be now smaller than the limit when t goes to minus infinity of those things there. Ah, uh, there should be an e to the minus kt here. Sorry, e to the minus kt should be there also. So do you know that limit exists? Yeah. Because it's, uh, it's monotone. Uh, so, 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 I, so, so I made a mistake that it should be an e to, it should be the same expression here as there, so it should be with the e to the minus kt also. And then it's monotone, so there is a, there is a limit. And uh, monotone when t gets... Yeah, yes, so... No, no, but it's... Monotone is... No, it's not going to be bounded, right? Because it's not... Yes, so... Does the directionality count? Yeah, well, yes, but I have h, t, t squared e to the minus kt. So uh, I, I draw this quantity. Let's call this uh, at. It looks something like this then. Uh, it, I said it was a decreasing, so it looks something like this maybe. And uh, then I say that this value here, which is what I'm interested in, will be smaller than the limit here when I go out to minus infinity. Uh, could be. In that case, it's not interesting. But uh, so far, it's all we claim. Well, I but I, I, I claim it is not. I claim it cannot really be minus. It cannot really be plus infinity. It, it, actually, it will be very easy to compute what the limit is. So the consequence of this here is that the optimal constant is sigma k. What is that? Why is that? So, so the theorem of Blochki and Guanshu is a consequence of this last inequality there. Because when, when t is close to minus infinity, I have a very, very thin little strip here. Very thin, looks like this. So, now, now t is close to minus infinity, I have a very thin thing. So I want to construct an extension. I can take any extension here. Uh, and when t, <coughs> when this is very thin, uh, I can compute more or less the norm of that, and you will see exactly that it gives you the, the value that you have there. If I got the e to, I should have had the e to the minus k t there. So the monotonicity is the is the key to the problem. Yeah. There is some convexity, yes. So I will get to that because that's the way we prove the monotonicity. Uh, so yeah. So now I want to sketch the proof of this. But I'm not going to sketch it in general. I'm going to sketch it uh, in a special case. So we take the special case when k is equal to n. So that means that uh, the variety here is just a point. Then I can draw a new picture, perhaps. Then the domain is just this. I have a point here, which is the origin, say. And uh, <coughs> the dt, this is d. This is dt. Something like that, looks like this. And uh, yes, 
And uh, then I want to extend a function, holomorphic function, on the point. That just means the value 1. I want to extend it to holomorphic function with uh, some estimates. So, so let's see. This is really a Bergman kernel estimate in disguise. Because if you remember the Bergman kernel, the Bergman kernel KT for the domain there was the supremum of this quotient. H at the value 0 divided by H, the norm of H. That was the Bergman kernel. Now I can normalize. So I can choose always H0 equal to 1. Here I get the 1 upstairs, and I get 1 over the norm. So to estimate this norm here, it's the same thing as estimating the Bergman kernel. So the theorem I want to prove is equivalent to saying, uh, let me see here if I, yeah, so now we get to the convexity that you asked about. Now I'm going to use that the logarithm of the Bergman kernel is a convex function of t. It's actually a subharmonic of t, but it only depends on the real part of t, so it's a convex function. Yes? And uh, the theorem is uh, equivalent now to saying that, let me see, sit down. So the theorem on the slide is equivalent to saying that this function is increasing because the relation between kt and the norm is 1 over here. So instead of looking at the, what we had before, we, we multiply the norm here by e to the minus nt. Now I get the Bergman kernel multiplied by e to the plus nt. And I want to prove that this is increasing now, this thing. I don't know if this is too confused or is it roughly correct. And now the convexity comes in. Now the convexity comes in. Because we, uh, this function here is convex. I add nt to it. It's still convex. The logarithm of the Bergman kernel is convex with respect to t. I add something linear, it's still convex. And moreover, I claim that it is easy to see that it is bounded when t goes to minus infinity. Because then you just need to estimate the Bergman kernel over essentially a small ball in here. And uh, that's, uh, yeah. And if you have any function which is like that, it's convex. So, so it doesn't look like that now. Look at that function. So it's defined on the negative half axis. It's convex. And it's bounded when you go out to minus infinity. It, well, it has to be increasing. So that finishes the proof though, in that case. So that's the. So, uh, so uh, still some. Uh, mm, no. Uh, so this was actually Laszlo's argument for the Suita conjecture. And then I suggested that we should prove that uh, it works for the uh, entire formulation of a Sabataki Koshi. This was just a special case when the uh, variety was a point. But uh, 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 and then in order to get the full Sabataki Koshi theorem, when you have higher dimension here and not just a point, we have to use the full formulation of the theorem, not just the theorem about the Bergman kernel, but the full formulation when we had them, those measures and uh, arbitrary measures, not only Dirac measures. Uh, but it is the, the, the principle of the argument is just the same as, I, as what I wrote up there. So that somehow gives you, that gives you the best constant then in those attack yours. And it also works in more generality for manifolds, etc. But I presented the simplest case here. I get back to, hopefully, and at the end, I will get back to Osawa Takigoshi for manifolds a little bit later. OK, so I leave this. And I go to the next topic. So it's uh, some example from Keller geometry. So this was uh, about Brun-Minkowski for domain in CN, the first one. And now we look at. Uh, uh, we, we, we look at compact manifolds now. So, so I'm going to this situation here when this is a proper vibration, and all of the fibers here are compact manifolds. But I'm only going to look at the special case of it first. I'm going to look at the special case when uh, this vibration is trivial. So I really have, so I have a cylinder. So I have this, I have a manifold here which is called x, and then I take the product of x with u 
here. So I have so this thing here is x times u. So so all the fibers here, I take a point t in in u. All the fibers here are the same. They are all x. So I have, I have a constant family of, of complex manifolds. And then I also throw in a line bundle. So I take a line bundle on x here. And then I let it define a line bundle on the product here just by pulling it back on the, uh, by the projection map onto x. So I, I take, so to speak, the same line bundle on each fiber here. So this is L underlined. Uh, so then we have a family of manifolds. And over each of these manifolds, we have a line bundle. They are all the same also. Nothing really changes. So uh, what is changing is a metric on the bundle. So I throw in now a metric on this L underlined on this bundle. I have a metric on the total space here. And this may change from fiber to fiber. So I can think of a metric on L underlined as uh, a curve of metrics for each t here, I get a metric on the fixed manifold and the fixed line bundle. So the only thing that changes is the metric on the line bundle. So I have a curve of metrics on a fixed line bundle over a fixed manifold. That's what I have. What? The metric, uh, se semi positive. So I mean that the IDD bar of it should be greater than or equal to zero. Could you take a metric that pulls back from u? Uh, here, like this? Yeah. So it, uh, not really, because it has to be a metric on the line bundle. And then, and then if, uh, if I just take a metric on u here, it would, so to speak, be constant on each fiber. No, I mean, uh, 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 no, pull, pull back from the line bundle. So, so, so I, uh, yeah, so I have, I could do that also, yeah, take a metric. But then it would be a constant metric. Then everybody, everything would be constant. Huh? And then it's not uh, the, that's not interesting then, because then nothing will change at all from fiber to fiber. But it's still allowed. It's still allowed, yes. It's still allowed. OK. And, and then I can take IDD bar of those things. IDD bar of this, is if it's strictly positive on the fibers here, uh, that will be a Keller metric on the fiber. So I have a curve of Keller metrics uh, on the fixed manifold X. And now we specialize further. So we, we choose a very particular bundle. So we take it to be uh, the dual of the canonical bundle of the fiber. So the dual of the bundle of N0 forms. So I assume that that is positive now, strictly positive on the fibers. That means that the fiber X here is a Fano manifold. This is a Fano manifold. So I have a family indexed by T in U here of a Keller metrics on a fixed Fano manifold. And now I'm, I was looking at the fibers of this. You had of, of my vector bundle. Well, they were ET, and they were equal to the space of holomorphic sections over X of K of X plus L, which is now minus K of X, so we, which looks very trivial. And indeed, it is very trivial. This is the trivial bundle. So I just look at the fibers here are the holomorphic functions on X now, in this case. And there are not so many. There are only the constants. So this is a, uh, yeah, it's a trivial bundle, and the only holomorphic sections are the constants. But still, I can do that. So, so that's really the simplest case of the theorem, if you want. And then you get this theorem. If you now assume that the variation here is uh, semi-positive, so, so this means that the IDD bar here should be, strict, should be greater than or equal to zero on the total space. So, so it should also be plurious of harmonic with respect to T. <coughs> and now I can look at uh, this expression here. A metric on the anti-canonical bundle can be identified by, with a volume form on the manifold. So uh, I write this somewhat elliptical here so that this stands for the associated volume form. Or alternatively, you could think of it as integral. You take 1. The bundle was trivial. It has only constant sections. So 1, for instance, you take 1 squared e to the minus phi. And you integrate over x. So that's what I mean by that. 
And then the conclusion is that if I form this integral here, I get uh, uh, phi tilde of t. And the conclusion is that this is a subharmonic function. So uh, in particular, if it does not depend on the imaginary part of t, it's convex. So this looks a lot like Prekopas theorem. Uh, I mean, if you change x to r and or c n here, it looks exactly like Prekopas theorem. But so it's a Prekopas theorem for Fano manifold, if you want to. OK, still no application. We just know this. And I should say that this particular case of the theorem is fairly easy to prove directly then, but that is not so important. So there is a converse to this. You can ask this function phi. Uh, yeah, so let's assume, let's assume here now that we are in the last case here, that the metric only depends on the real part of t and not on the imaginary part of t. So then it's convex. And I'll say that it is not really strictly convex, but it's actually linear. Say so it's linear. What can we get then? Well, the conclusion is that if it is linear, and moreover you assume that phi t is bounded, just some technical condition, but this is uh, actually quite delicate. So we assume that it is bounded. Then there is a, uh, the conclusion is that then the situation must indeed be trivial. So then there is a holomorphic vector field on the manifold X such that uh, all those scalar metrics, they are really the same after applying the flow of the holomorphic vector field. So nothing really changes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. In, no, uh, in the previous theorem, it's enough to assume that the anti-canonical is semi-positive. But in this, well, in this theorem, I want it to be positive. So I really want, I think I do. Uh, Maybe I need to check. Maybe it could be. But let's assume it is strictly positive in, or along the fibers. But the variation in this direction does not need to be strictly positive. It can just be semi-positive. So if it is indeed not strictly positive, but actually only linear in this direction, those integrals, then as a matter of fact, there is a uh, vector field on x. I can uh, compute the flow. There is a flow associated with that vector field. I apply it to the forms. and. Uh, Applying this, we see uh, all the Keller forms would be the same. So, so, so then the situation is trivial. So in case you assume that uh, everything here is smooth, etc., this follows more or less uh, immediately from the formulas. But if you don't assume that you have any regularity, uh, this is uh, dirty somehow. So, but uh, still, it, uh, it holds. Oh, the only assumption you need on phi is that it's locally bounded. So no singularities, no serious singularities on phi. OK, so why is this uh, useful? Well, one can use it to prove generalizations of the Bandung-Mabuchi uniqueness theorem for, for Keller-Einstein metrics. So when you have Keller-Einstein metrics on a Fano manifold, there is this classical theorem by Bandung and Mabuchi that say, says that if you have two such metrics, there is a ve holomorphic vector field on the manifold with a flow such that if you apply the flow to that, you will transport one metric to the other. So, so uh, the Kell-Einstein metrics are unique up to the action of uh, uh, holomorphic automorphisms. That's the bandung mabuchi theorem. You can get the proof for that now, and also even in a more general situation, as I will come to in a while. So this was first observed by Robert Biermann. And then it was generalized to a singular situation by all those people there. And then it was actually used in, this, in the work by Chen Donaldson Soon on uh, the existence of Kell Einstein metrics. Because intimately related to this is the so called Matsushima theorem about the reductivity of the automorphism group. And uh, uh, this allows for a singular version of the Matsushima theorem. But let's forget about that. I just mentioned this as applications of the proof. So let me sketch uh, very rapidly how this goes. And it's a little bit embarrassing because there are some real experts on this matter here. But uh, maybe I should. Yeah, I sh I, I'll sketch it rapidly. 
So uh, we have to introduce first, in order to understand it, we have to Im introduce the Mont-Champaire energy of a metric. And it's defined in this way. So the classical definition is that you define the E of phi. E is the energy of phi. It's defined up to a constant by saying how it varies when, when phi varies. So the derivative of E of phi with respect to t should be this thing. And actually, I probably should have a plus sign here if, you, if I want to have it consistent with what I get later. But let's be generous about that. So you define this function of the mont Ampere energy by saying what its derivative is. You can write down an explicit formula also. And then you cook up the so-called Ding functional after Ding that discovered it, which here would be minus L phi plus the mont Ampere energy. And L phi is precisely this logarithmic integral that I had before. Now, the relevance of this for Keller-Einstein metrics is that Keller-Einstein metrics are the critical points of the Ding functional. If you take the derivative of this thing with respect to, uh, if phi depends on t and you differentiate with respect to t, say the derivative is phi, a psi, you get uh, the derivative of the first thing here would be integral of a psi here with a minus sign. Ah, yeah, too many minus signs. Maybe I was right as, as it's written here. So you get this. And, uh, and this from differentiating the logarithm. And then uh, we define the mont Ampere energy so that the last thing holds here also. If I, get the cons if I get the signs right now, you will see that this is zero for all choices of psi, if and only if e to the minus phi is equal to uh, omega phi uh, raised to the power n modulo constant. And that's exactly the Keller-Einstein equation. It means that uh, if you, you take the logarithm of this and you take dd bar, you get the Ricci, and then you get omega phi on the other side. So they must be equal. So this is a way of writing the Keller-Einstein equation. So Keller-Einstein metrics are critical functional, are critical points of this function. And then, uh, uh, yeah, you can, there is a notion of geodesic. I'll skip over what that means. And it follows from uh, the theorem that the Ding functional is convex along geodesics. Because, the, yeah. And then there is a theorem by Chen. In this case, it's easier because you don't need a full force of Chen's theorem, but never mind. Uh, that any two points in uh, any such matrix can be connected with the geodesic. So the Ding functional if you take a geodesic that connects two critical points, you get a curve there. The Ding functional is convex along it. The two endpoints, the derivative is zero. So the only, only possibility for this is that the Ding functional is actually linear along the geodesic. So, you, so here is a, here's a Keller-Einstein metric. It's another Keller-Einstein metric. The Ding functional uh, is a geodesic between them. And the Ding functional d of t along the geodesic will be like this. But the derivative at the two endpoints is zero. So it must actually, the Ding functional must actually be a constant. <coughs> Ding functional must be constant if it's convex. And therefore, the L functional must be linear. And then the converse theorem says that we, we have all those automorphisms that relate to metrics. Because the converse said that if uh, the L functional is linear along some curve, then uh, the curve must uh, arise from holomorphic automorphisms. So this way you get the uniqueness of Keller-Einstein matrix of the automorphism. And the point, uh, one point with this proof is that it applies with less regularity. You can study, for instance, uh, twisted Keller-Einstein equation where this function here can have singularities. So it includes metrics uh, with conical singularities, for instance. And it also applies to keller ricci solitons, something which Janir asked me to study. But, you, but, uh, but actually, it works perfectly well for solitons also. So that's the way you get the theorem by Tian and Shu. That way. Uh, so uh, you just change a little bit. So in the case of twisted Keller-Einstein metrics, you look at this functional instead. You take e to the minus 5, but you add the function psi there. 
And in the second case, you keep the, you, you don't change the L functional, but you change the energy a little bit to the so-called true energy, which I will not go through here. But you can prove uniqueness for solitons, and you can prove uniqueness for up to automorphisms for uh, twisted Kelly-Einstein metrics also, using this Brun minkowski or Plekopa sort of argument here. Is it? OK, is it uh, more or less OK, or yeah? So I go on. So I, and now I look at, so this was a trivial vibration. Now I look at the non-trivial vibration. I'm, yeah? In your previous talk, when you mentioned Plekopa theory, did you talk about the equality No, no, no. So, no. so that's pretty nice. In the real Plekopa case, you, uh, there is a counterpart of this theorem here for the real Plekopa, uh, which says that if you have, so in the real Plekopa, you have a convex function of t and x. And if you have, uh, so to speak, uh, equality in the Prekopa inequality, then this function has to have a very special form. It has to look like you take one function of x, and then you add t times some vector. This is equality in the real case. You take one function that depends only on x, and you use the t variable to translate it. That's the only possibility to have equality in precopas inequality in the real setting. So this is formally very similar than here you have the flow of a constant vector field. In the other situation, you have a flow of a holomorphic vector field. So, so somehow all the time the translation is this. You, you change constants to holomorphic things, and then you get the corresponding theorem in the complex setting. That's, uh... OK, and now uh, we look at briefly at a non-trivial vibration. And we have the same situation. We have a line bundle over the total space, etc. And now we, I will assume definitely that uh, IDD bar of phi is strictly positive over the fiber. So, because otherwise it will not work. Otherwise it will not even be true, the conclusion I want to write. Uh, first, it will not make sense. And <laughs> second, it will not be true. Uh, so uh, let's say now that this B here is a part of C. This is an open set of C, so the base is one dimension. I can think of it as a coordinate patch. Let, uh, it's just for, uh, it's easier to state them. But then now we have a, a lot of machinery here. So let me, here we have a vector field on the base here, which is dt, which is just B dt, a holomorphic vector field on the base. Now, a lift of that field is a field up here. So I have the, this vector field here, points like this. Now I can lift it, it's going to look like this. And, the, and the, that it's a lift means that if I apply the P to that, I will get the DDT there. So the differential of P acting on the vector field up there should be equal to DT. That's a lift of a vector field. Uh, not holomorphic. So uh, it cannot be chosen holomorphic in general. Uh, so it's just a real vector field. So therefore, you compute the d bar of it uh, to measure how far it is from being holomorphic. And then you get something that I call kappa. And that is uh, Cordera Spencer form. So if you take the cohomology class of that, it will be the Cordera Spencer cohomology class of the fibration. So if you can uh, choose it holomorphic, uh, somehow the vibration is trivial, infinitesimally trivial, means that you can choose the V in a holomorphic way. Uh, but now, the, so the kappa will be a zero, one zero form, but the values in uh, vertical vector fields. Vector valued zero one form. And uh, by Schumacher, building on the work of by Su, there is a canonical lift of this vector field up here. I will not go through how that is obtained, but there is a specific way that you can choose the lift here, depending on the metric data. So, but I will not go through that, but there is such a canonical lift. And uh, now again, we look at the same vector bundle, the vector bundle of holomorphic sections over the fiber, and we have the norm defined as before. 
And now I can compute the curvature of this. So the theorem says that the curvature is positive, but now I can compute the curvature. I can write down an explicit formula. So first I define a function c of phi, which is equal to this. So here I take d d bar of phi on the total space, and I raise it to the power n plus 1. And here I take it, uh, raise it to the power n, and I wedge it with this. The, and the coefficients, the, the quotient between this form and that form is called c of phi. It's going to be some non-negative function. And uh, then we have this formula here. The curvature is explicitly given by this operator. So I take, uh, yeah, yeah, so I introduce u1 is the, is this the Cordela Spencer form? It operates naturally on the, on the on the form U. I get U1, and I I take the uh, the Keller metric defines a Laplace operator. I take this thing here, the Laplace operator, uh, apply it to U1, and etc. Uh, etc. Et so that's uh, what the theorem says. It's an explicit formula for the for the curvature. So why is that useful? Well, this is useful first. So, so this is the formula. So if you assume now that idd bar of phi is greater than or equal to zero on the total space, then this will be non-negative. So, uh, so assume now that the curvature is zero. Then both of the terms will have to be zero because both of the terms are non-negative. So uh, c phi must be zero and u1 must be zero, which means that kappa must be zero. So the conclusion of this is that the canonical lift is holomorphic, so the vibration is trivial. We can use this holomorphic vector field to trivialize. If you change, it by the, you change the vibration by the flow of the field, you make it into a trivial vibration. And you can also do it in such a way that all the metrics and everything follow along. So you really get a, the situation that you asked about. It's really this trivial situation in disguise. It's a trivial vibration, and the line bundle and the metric, they all are constant on the fiber after a biholomorphic change like that. Here, here. The thing that causes it to be true. Oh, so, so basically, you're saying that if you have a vector bundle that has zero curvature. Yes, if this vector bundle has zero curvature, then both. Uh, oh, no, push forward in the vector bundle. Right. So, so I, I have a vector. Uh, alpha, yeah. So, so, alpha K hmm? You have a line bundle. I have a line bundle L over this space here. And, and, and then I push forward the line bundle, uh, or rather the n forms with the values in the line bundle. Yeah. I push it forward, I get the vector bundle down here. If that vector bundle has zero curvature, then uh, uh, everything has to be trivial. Yeah. Everything has to be true. So I think this is, is related to Torelli-type theorems. In, uh, but, but let's come to this later. This is a little bit more general so far here. So this is about any positive L here. Uh, sorry? That form, the curvature, is very reminiscent of that. Yeah, so that's what I'm coming to next, actually. So, so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so uh, in the special case now, we, uh, so, uh, so now we assume that uh, uh, all of the fibers have positive canonical bundle now. So for instance, if they are one-dimensional, they are Riemann surfaces, positive canonical bundle means that the genus is greater than two. Then I can use that as my L. The previous theorem worked for any L. But now I can apply it for the line bundle, the relative canonical bundle, which is a line bundle on the total space that restricts to the canonical on each fiber. I can apply the theorem to that. And... Uh, uh, in that case, there is an argument by Schumacher. I will do that quickly also. Which, uh, the conclusion is that in that case, the C, if I choose the phi to be the Keller-Einstein potential on each fiber, then the C phi will be positive. That's what I want to say here. So I d d bar of phi will be positive in that case automatically. So I, I don't choose. I choose the curve like this. I choose the curve. For each xt, I take the Keller-Einstein potential. Here is another Keller-Einstein potential. 
and, uh, and I, so to speak, I put them together, and then it will be automatic that the variation with respect to T will also be subharmonic, so it fits into the theorem. And this is due to this theorem of Schumacher. That's a non-trivial fact. So we can apply the theorem, and we can get that this space here uh, has positive curvature. So now I put in, so, so here I have like n forms with values in the canonical bundle. If you think of uh, the case when n is equal to 1, so that the fibers are Riemann surfaces, these are the quadratic differentials. So then it's getting closer to uh, this uh, business, right? And uh, actually, let me spell this out here. So the Cordela Spencer formed, they, they lived in this space. And this space is isomorphic to, if you, uh, is isomorphic to this n minus 1, 1 forms with values in the anti-canonical bundle. You, you take a tensor product with that, and you will get that this space is isomorphic to that. This is not entirely trivial, but it's, it's not the deep fact. It's just the computation that this space is actually equivalent to that. And then if you take duals, you will get, you will get this space. Here I have h n minus 1, 1, and here I will get h 1 n minus 1. And then I will uh, say that the space where the Cordela Spencer form lives, that's the tangent space or the Teichmuller space. And here we are talking about arbitrary dimensions so far, arbitrary dimension. So I can look at the Teichmuller space of canonically polarized things uh, in some diffeomorphism class. Yes. So, so far, but uh, so up to this point, we have arbitrary dimension. Yeah. But now the next line, I take n equal to 1. <laughs> so now we have uh, Riemann surfaces. We have families of Riemann surfaces. And then you get that this space, h1, 1, 1, n minus 1, becomes h1, 0, uh, which is h, n, 0. <laughs> uh, so for n equal to 1, it becomes this space that we knew something about. We don't, we don't know anything. Those spaces, my theorem does not apply to those, but it does apply to this one. So it's OK uh, when uh, the fiber dimension is 1. And uh, then you can think of this. Uh, this is it's the bundle of quadratic differentials. You can think of that as the cotangent bundle of Teichmuller space. And it has, uh, the fact that this has positive curvature means that the Teichmuller space itself has negative curvature, which is all force theorem now. And if you, do, if you look at the explicit, explicit formula that I had, it's really ex exactly, you can translate the formula, and you get Scott's formula in, in, in this case, uh, when n is equal to 1, and you choose uh, this line bundle on those metrics, et cetera. But, you, but you, you still have to do some computations, because if you, if you look at it like this, Richard said that it looks a lot like Scott's formula. But it looks a lot like Scott's formula if you know a lot about this, uh, this, uh, these things, because it, it, formally it, uh, you, you still have to do some computations in order to, tra to translate this. To, but it's really the same formula in, in that case. So if you want to, you can view it as a generalization of what he had. Well, yeah, to end with something very uh, uh, very quick again, then, which is related a little bit to what you said before about uh, plurigenera, et cetera. Uh, so we still have a non-trivial fibration. But I don't assume it's a fibration now. So I assume it's just a surjective map. So I don't assume that it's a submersion or anything. So it means that I have, I have uh, things like this. I have a total space here. I have a map P that goes down to some base. B can be higher dimensional now. And uh, mostly, it will be a submersion, so the fibers will look like this. But at some point, there will be singularities if it's not a submersion. that may have singularities. So what can we say in that case, then? Uh, well, I'm maybe a little bit ahead of myself. We, 
We have a notion of Bergman kernel for such things like we had in uh, domains in CN. But the Bergman kernel will now, if you, if you see, it will depend on, on choice of trivialization. And it will actually be not be a function, but it will be a metric on this bundle. The Bergman kernel, in this case, will be a metric on this bundle, the twisted relative canonical bundle. And uh, so this is defined. The way I did it is defined when you have a smooth vibration, the Bergman kernel metric. And then in joint work with Mihai Pohn, we extended that to uh, only surjective maps. So it's, if it's just surjective, then it's mostly outside the sub-variety. It's a submersion. So we can take the Bergman kernel metric. But now the theorem says that we can extend it to a singular metric uh, on the total space. So we get a singular metric of positive, no, of non, uh, yeah, of semi-positive curvature on the total space. So uh, it, uh, the Bergman kernel metric defines a singular metric of non-negative curvature on this bundle. Huh? Uh, by. Uh, we, we, I started with a phi, which was a metric on L, but now I get another metric. Which is still called phi. Uh, yes, which is not good. I should have called it something else. I should have. But then the condition at the end, is it with respect to the original phi or the new phi? Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, okay, so I was. I was right. So I, I allow also, I actually allow the original phi to be singular. So I assume that there is one fiber that has finite L2 norm uh, on, uh, there is one fiber on which there is a section that has finite L2 norm with respect to this original phi. Then this metric, the Bergman kernel metric, will, be, will not be identically zero, and it will define a genuine singular metric of non-negative curvature. That's how it works. Where do you just blew up a point on like V2? Then is, the, is there phi in the exceptional divisor? Just yes. Minus yes, yes, yes. It's minus infinity on the whole guy. Uh, yeah, something like that, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yes, exactly. Well, uh, I don't claim that it should be uh, that there should be uh, some L2 condition on every fiber. I say that there should be some fiber over which there is a section that has finite L2 norm. Yeah, but then my question is, if, if phi is originally defined only on one fiber, no? No, no, phi is defined. Phi is defined over the total space. Phi is defined over the total space. Yes. So I start with a metric. I start with phi. Which is a metric on, which is a metric on L, and then I get the Bergman kernel. I get the phi Bergman kernel. I get a new metric, which is not a metric on L. It's a met, it's a metric on the canonical twisted canonical plus L. So I, I start with a uh, with a positive metric on a bundle, and I get a new positive metric on a new bundle, on on the twisted bundle. I need to have a metric on L to begin with, yes. But you still, you say it's just minus infinity on L. I think so, yes, yes, yes. I, I, yes, I think in that case so. And it's also, you can apply it to, say, elliptic vibrations, a la Codeira. So you can have multiple fibers, for instance. And then you will have also minus infinities, or, yeah, minus infinities on the, on the singular fibers. Yeah. Well. But the point is somehow that if, if uh, the morale of the theorem is that if L is positive, then this is positive. So the can relative canonical always gives something more positive. So somehow, one consequence is that you can start with, say, the canonical here, and then you get twice the canonical here. Then you can feed in this one here. You get three times the canonical, and you get positive metrics on all multiples of a relative canonical bundle this way, for instance. Uh, what? What if you start with something where the canonical is negative? Yeah, then it doesn't work. So this, is, uh, this theorem is mostly interesting when you have some uh, fibers of general type or something like that, yes. Oh, well, uh, unless L is very positive. L is very positive. Oh, that, oh it's because of the condition that... That, that there should be a section on some. There has to be a section. So if yeah. you took x equal to b plus b1, then this wouldn't be a... I guess it would be 
A section. section. Yeah. So you have to assume that. Because otherwise, I mean, the Bergman kernel is defined in terms of supremum over all sections, et cetera, or something. If there are no sections, there, there is no Bergman kernel. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But the, the remarkable thing is that somehow that you need a condition only on one fiber to guarantee this. And then you will get something uh, for the whole thing. Well, when that's defeating in L equals K, is there Yes, so for instance, you can use this somehow, or there are variants of this you can use to construct, because the invariance of plurigenera is very much, so, so maybe I think my time is running out here, but the invariance of plurigenera is very much tied to the construction of metrics. You want metrics on M times the relative canonical bundle. You, this is this line, but M is some large, well, maybe not even large, but you want to have metrics of non-negative curvature on this then. And this somehow is one way to construct such metrics on, on, on this bundle. And once you have positive metrics there, you can apply the osawa takigoshi theorem to extend things from a fiber to other, other fibers. So I just end here by saying that uh, this was extended by Pawn and Takayama, who uh, showed that even in this case where you just have a surjective map here, you can, take, you can still take the direct image of, a, of this thing here, and you get a sheaf in general, and not a vector bundle. You get a sheaf. They defined metrics on, it's a coherent sheaf. You define metrics on coherent sheaf, and they get uh, such uh, metrics uh, with positive curvature or non-negative curvature. And this uh, somehow this uh, extends. But this gives a metric approach to uh, uh, theory of Feeweg on uh, weak positivity for vector bundles. For he had a theory, but, but, but that would go too far, and I know too little about it. But Feeweg has a notion of weak positivity for such direct image bundles, and this gives a metric version of that. Because algebraic geometers, they don't speak about positivity in the terms of some curvature tensor being positive. They say that it means that there are sections of something or the other. But here you get a genuine such thing. And then finally, they applied this to the Itaka conjecture. But I, I don't think. So this was applied by, this kind of thing was applied by Jung Yang Xiao and Mihai Pan to prove a special case of the Itaka conjecture for the Kodera dimensions. Uh, assuming that the base then uh, was the torus, uh, then they could uh, use those metrics to prove it. But I will not. I don't have time to go through that, so I'll stop here. Thank you.